Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the 2014-15 Noble Webinar Series, Married Students for the Global Workplace. Uh, can I, okay, we, so I, I already kind of checked that everyone can hear me and everyone's got the chat box down. Uh, my name's Mary Reisner. I'm Associate Director at the University of Florida Center for Latin American Studies and the Director of the Noble Project Network of Business Language Educators. Our guest today is Kathleen Stein-Smith, who is a librarian and adjunct professor at Fairleigh or Fairleigh? Fairleigh. Fairleigh Dickinson University. And she's joining us from New Jersey. Uh, Kathy is a big advocate for foreign languages. Her main language is French, but she advocates for all languages or study of all languages and uh, cultures. So we are glad to have her here today to talk to us uh, about the advantages of languages and preparing um, for careers. Uh, so again, welcome to everyone. Um, well, webinar format, we basically just start with some introductions, um, have our guest speaker share thoughts and comments. Uh, attendees can talk through the chat throughout, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end we will also have Q&A. And it kind of be up to Kathy if anybody wants to, if she's okay with uh, asking in between. Okay. All right. Absolutely. So, Questions anytime. Okay, great. Yeah, because we definitely want this to, we want people to engage and interact um, and not have anyone go to sleep on us. So, uh, can everyone tell us where they're joining us from today? I'm in Gainesville, Florida. Kathy's in New Jersey, Champaign, Illinois, Gainesville, Florida, Cape Canaveral, Space Center, Space Center. Uh, well, um, well, and I'll put in a plug here for Brigitte and Paulina in the chat box. They're both great students. Uh, Brigitte is actually working on the new grad student group for Noble, remote languages for specific purposes. And Paulina is actually here from Poland doing research uh, for Latin American business. And she also um, works with languages and translation. So welcome to everyone. Uh, quickly, just a little commercial about Noble, the Noble website, resources that you can find there. Um, in addition to K through 12 program resources, there's lists of uh, uh, LSP business uh, language courses for post-secondary as well, minor, minors, majors, and certificate programs use as models. We have K through 12 courses that you can look at for models. Advocacy resources, resources by different languages. So, so I encourage you to visit that when you have a chance. Um, Think about collaborating with Noble, joining in on the social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, send us an email if you have an idea for a webinar topic or guest expert you would like to suggest. Um, think about presenting at conferences with us and um, developing course materials. So just um, you can contact us through the website. Uh, upcoming webinars, uh, today is the first one with Kathy and uh, we have one a month to the end of this year and um, we'll be launching the graduate student group so we're um, hoping any faculty can um, mention this opportunity to grad students because they are the next generation to change the, the way we think about what we're doing in the, the language classroom. Uh, we have four or five more webinars up in the spring. I was trying not to overwhelm with more slides actually one of our participants today, Annie Abbott from Illinois, she is also presenting in the spring and will be sharing resources. Um, she might mention a little bit at the end. Um, but all of this is available on the, web, um, the website with the webinar schedule. Okay, 
and just here's my contact information. And I am going to now upload Kathy's PowerPoint, and we can get going. Uh, there we go. I'm going to turn off my camera now. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and especially thank Dr. Reisner for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, as you can see the title of the presentation, How Foreign Languages Can Give You the Professional Edge. Um, it's so important in this era when we have um, relatively high unemployment still, especially among young people, um, for us to really think about how best to empower young people to approach the workplace. You know, in the United States, especially here in North Jersey, and very especially here on a, a university campus, we have um, many students who are uh, studying foreign languages. We also have heritage language speakers in the local community as well as here on campus. And that was really what got me to thinking about foreign languages in the workplace. You know, as, as Mary had mentioned, um, I am a foreign language advocate. Um, my doctoral research was on the United States foreign language deficit, what it means to us, how it negatively impacts us, what we can do about it. Um, but I think also that foreign language deficit here in the United States has impacted the ability of our young people to find work and to build the careers that they should be able to build. You know, I think there are two challenges. Um, number one is raising awareness among students, among young learners. Um, many American, young American learners um, think that um, there are very few opportunities to use foreign languages in the workshop, in the workplace. They may think, oh, well, uh, English is the global lingua franca in business. Not always true. Um, they may also think that um, the only jobs available are jobs as foreign language educators. And while there are many jobs available as foreign language educators and wonderful career opportunities, a career as an educator is not everyone's first choice. There are many, many other careers available. And I think lots of our young people and their parents and their local social support networks don't necessarily know that. I think that's a huge first challenge. And let's just say we are successful in um, bringing young people to foreign languages at the age where they can learn them best, learn them most easily. You know, what happens is as, as youngsters grow, uh, the influence of parents and grandparents and teachers may diminish. We reach adolescence, young adulthood, and also foreign languages are not always easy to learn. It's not a straight path. There are the inevitable plateaus. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, uh, and a sustained effort over a period of time. So I think other challenge is really um, not only creating the motivation, but sustaining it and developing a framework to sustain that motivation. Now, that being said, I'd like to talk about a very high profile event, a partnership, that was in part designed to increase awareness, awareness of foreign languages. And, and that was the Many Languages, One World essay contest and global youth forum. The essay contest was launched in October 2013, just a year ago, at the UN. It was a, project, a collaboration of the UN Academic uh, Impact and ELS Educational Services. All right, so there you've got government, international government, and you've got the private sector. Um, the event, the stay in New York, was hosted by Delphi University about 35 miles from where I sit right now. So there you've got corporate, academic, and government working together. And of course, high profile. Now, uh, the, for those of you looking at my slide, I use the term language enterprise. 
that's an expression that I really did pick up reading um, things written by Dr. William Rivers and hearing him speak. But I think this is an example of the language enterprise at work. And I think this is very important. I'll even I'll come back to it later. All right, I gave some links for those of you who want to, um, uh, at a later date or now as I speak, look at these websites as, as we, we go along. This is a picture of my group at the Many Languages One World um, uh, Global Youth Forum. I was the French language facilitator. And basically, how this all came about was I was contacted by ELS in the spring of last year. And I was told there were semi-finalists selected. There were somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20. And would I interview these youngsters? And they were from all over, from um, Tunisia, from Germany, from South Africa, from the um, Philippines. Would I interview them via Skype? and uh, in order to really uh, ascertain that they were fluent in French, or at least fluent enough to address the General Assembly. So I did that in May of last year. And then in June, actually the winners, the finalists, 10 for each language, were flown, all expenses paid, to New York. They were housed at Adelphi. They spent a great weekend in New York. But the high point of the trip was their presentations on that Friday morning at the General Assembly. So this is a picture of us on the campus of Adelphi preparing for those presentations. Each student prepared a PowerPoint slide. They each had approximately two minutes to speak at the UN. My group was a group of nine because one of the students, just the time, did not permit for him to obtain his visa. But basically, it was 10 per official language of the UN. The intent of this contest was to promote the study of multilingualism, first of all, but also the study of the official languages, the six official languages of the UN, of which French is one. And so there were six groups of 10. Uh, actually, of all the 60 winners, 57 actually came to New York City. There were three who did not get visas, could not travel. Um, but it was a, a great experience of working with these young people. They bright between the ages of, the minimum age was 18. I think my group was probably between the ages of maybe 18 and 25. They had some older graduate students, but they were from across the disciplines. Some of the students were studying law, some were studying international relations, others were preparing to be translators, um, language services workers in the European Union. There was a medical student in another group. So they were very interdisciplinary, all fluent in the language that they were representing. But also, I mean, honestly, they all were able to get along also in English. So it was great to see the interplay of languages. These were generally multilingual young people. And this is a picture of us at the, the General Assembly. Now, if the General Assembly looks a little bit unfinished here, it's because this was the temporary GA. The General Assembly itself was under renovation in, at the end of June when we were there. It has since reopened. But this is our group. They're all dressed up preparing. They're at the GA prior to their, um, to their presentation. And this is the signing of the agreement. Here you've got the representative of the UN um, Department of Information. You've got Mark Harris, the CEO of, um, of um, uh, ELS Educational Services. And you've got the representative of the academic impact uh, here in place. So how this all unfolded was that the essays were due in the language that could not be the native language of the student or the language in which the student had received the bulk of his or her schooling. Essays had, were due in the spring. I came into the process in May as an interviewer of the semi-finalist and then as the facilitator. You know, I think this program is just a great example um, that can be replicated, perhaps not on such a grand scale, but can be replicated um, 
scaled down to size in different settings of recognizing, promoting, rewarding, um, you know, um, respecting um, multilingualism and, you know, the study of foreign languages generally. Now, the topic of the day, of course, is foreign language skills and the workplace. Well, you, it's hard to open a newspaper or to go online and not to see articles talking about the need for foreign language skills. Now, these are just a few recent, relatively recent articles that I saw. Not the only articles, maybe not the best articles, but articles that I saw. First article, why are U.S. business executives so ineffective at selling? Okay, one of the reasons put forth is because they get over there and typically are not fluent in the local language. Real estate, you know, there's the, um, the Billy quote, which may be an urban legend about if you're going to sell, you need to speak the language of the person you are selling to. Real estate agencies. Then we have a slightly older article from CNN, The Hottest Job Skill. And now this article is interesting because it ran just at the time that the uh, most recent update of the Occupational Outlook Handbook, published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, came out. And we'll see those figures a little bit further on. And then an older article, Foreign Language Skills Provide a Sharp Edge in the Job Market. But there are many, many of these articles. I don't know, however, if all of our young people are reading these articles. Um, don't know if their parents and their, their families are aware of all of this. Oh, okay, I see a question coming in from Mary. Um, according to um, my information, actually altogether 4,000 people participated in the Essay Contest and Global Youth Forum. Now that includes the student authors, it includes readers at the UN and at ELS, it includes interviewers, facilitators. I believe 14, over 1,400 essays were received from around the world. Students from as far away as Australia, Kazakhstan, um, and students as close by, one student in my group uh, was from the U.S., from St. Louis. Um, and of the 1,400, um, there were 60 winners. Now, this is the data from the current Occupational Outlook Handbook. The 2012 medium pay for a language services worker, translator or interpreter, was $45,430 a year. Now, I, I ha I've had at least one student say to me, well, that's not all that much. Well, I mean, we live in the New York market where cost of living, cost of doing business is relatively higher than, than many other places. But bear in mind, the median national income in the same Occupational Outlook Handbook is at 34000 So it's net 11000 plus above the national median. Now, it's interesting. I, I see Mary has just um, posted about promoting the contest again. You know, I don't know if the contest is going to run again. I have not seen or heard anything. And I know the UN um, it was interesting, um, when I was actually at the UN listening to the speakers, I actually became aware of the fact that the original idea for this, um, the Many Languages, One World, had come from our um, late president here at FDU, Gil Adams, that he had been very actively involved um, in, or in creating the UN academic impact working with the UN. And he sadly, he fell ill and, and passed away in 2012. But apparently, this contest had been an idea that he had put forth to the folks at ELS, Educational Language Services. And um, you know, it all came together in this contest. I would be 
I would be absolutely delighted to see um, you know, uh, the contest repeat itself, even on a smaller scale. Now, I'm noticing a comment coming in from Brigida. You know, the median pay that I quoted um, is the median, um, whether it's for freelancers or people working for outfits like Lionbridge or TransPerfect. I, I'm not, I don't have all the information how they arrived at their data, how they arrive at all their data. What they do say, though, in the entry, if you read the entire entry in the um, Occupational Outlook Handbook, what they do say is translators can easily earn in the six figures. You know, this is a median pay. So there are as many people earning more than 40,000, 45,000, 430 as are earning below. And of course, with translation today being so uh, technological, you know, you can easily, depending what your language pairs are and where your location is, you can easily be living in a part of the world where uh, the cost of living is relatively low. But if your language pairs are in demand, you're going to be relatively well compensated. And in addition to that, your money will go further. So you can actually be very affluent, well off as a language services worker. What's even better, and I'm always thinking of our students, the job outlook, it's growing much faster than average. You know, education jobs in foreign languages and overall tend to be growing at about the national average. These are growing 46% over the next 10 years. So an additional 30,000 jobs good paying jobs for our students. And, you know, I, I think this is information that many of our students don't have. Now, the current status of foreign language skills in the U.S. I know right here I'm preaching to the converted here, we're preaching to the choir. Um, you're all language folk and you probably know all of this chapter and verse. But in the United States, one in four people re replied to a Gallup survey that they pulled the conversation in one additional language. 18.5% of K-12 students are enrolled in a foreign language. That's less than one and fewer than one in five. College and university students, 8.6%, down from 16% in 1960 when they basically started keeping this data. In the United States, um, just over half of the states have or are considering a high school foreign language graduation requirement. So really, foreign languages are not an everyday thing for many, many students in this country. Now, in Europe, and, I mean, there are reports that come out, and sometimes the percentage points um, wobble by percentage point or two. But um, at least um, a Eurobarometer survey brought back these responses. 56% at least one additional language. And this is capability of conversing. At least two additional languages, 28%. At least three additional languages, 11%. So these figures just show the difference just between, for example, Europeans and Americans. But you can travel to many parts of the world and you'll find comparable statistics. Okay, the importance of foreign language skills in the U.S. to business and government. We've had several Senate hearings, most recently in 2012, 2010 and 2012, on the U.S. language gap. We've had the um, Stimson report. Many jobs in U.S. diplomacy remain unfilled because there just aren't the qualified people with the needed language skills. There aren't the qualified people to fill those positions. The U.S. military, they've had the defense um, language transformation roadmap since 2005. Uh, they do practice, uh, they do have the practice of uh, proficiency pay for military who have needed languages and are available to, um, to implement those languages. We have countless GAO reports and research reports um, 
there was one, What What Business Needs, that came out um, done by the Language Flagship in 2009. And it was language need, foreign language needs for the 21st century. But there are countless reports. Um, you know, I have to admit, I, I had them in the original draft PowerPoint that I sent to Dr. Reisner. And of course, she said it's way too long. And that's true. But if any of you, at the end of the day, if any of you want to, um, to hear from me or to ask me for names and, and web links to any of these reports, let me know. I'm happy to share. Now, um, before we started, um, one of the participants asked me, how did you get involved in this or how did you get into this? And, and I answered the question the way I understood it at that moment. Okay, thank you, Mary. I'll be sure to send you the links. I see your comment coming in. Um, but uh, actually, the question might have been, how did I get involved with uh, the Network of Business um, Language Educators? And that actually was I came across Dr. Reisner's um, video. It's on YouTube, Are We Prepared for the Jobs of the Future? I show this to a lot of my language and culture classes. I think it's it's a great it's three, four, five minutes long, but it's a great overview for young people what uh, how important languages can and should be to them. And if any of you haven't seen it yet, I really I recommend that you watch it. Now, what opportunities are there out there? Well, there are lots of opportunities, but they fall into three broad categories. The first is really to work as a language specialist. Careers in education, teaching, teaching ESL, careers in language services, um, translation, interpreting. You know, it's interesting. Um, the, I don't think the typical American student realizes that the language services sector, that's translating and interpreting, is about a $35 billion sector of the economy. That figure, I saw it on language policy, and I've seen it on common sense advisory. Um, so it's, it's an, an accurate figure. That's huge, a $35 billion sector, and needing, needing workers. Um, career opportunities enhanced by foreign language skills. And that could be global education, international business. Um, there are a lot of opportunities working in export. Um, a lot of uh, careers are enhanced by foreign language skills. And then other careers. And that's a little bit general. But I'm thinking of people like um, medical interpreters, um, cultural anthropologists, um, court interpreters. Um, all kinds of people working for all kinds of companies where, tangentially, their knowledge of another language might come in handy. You could be working in any line of work. If you're working in a multilingual community or doing business internationally, those language skills are just going to come, come into play, um, probably unexpectedly, uh, from time to time. OK, all right. The video, uh, also thanks to Linda Markley's FFLA conference. Okay, it's it's a great video if you haven't seen it, or and, and I think it works well with I teach um, undergraduate and graduate university students um, in large and small class settings, and it has worked well the times that I've shown it to students. Gives them food for thought. Now, it's interesting. You know, you get into this, um, the careers in education. Now, again, my beloved Occupational Outlook Handbook, there are other sources we could look at, too. Um, but we've got median pay for high school teachers, $55,050 per year. That includes foreign language teachers. Projected rate of growth, though, is slower than average. So for a youngster coming up, there are not the opportunities and the future opportunities for employment that there might be in the language services sector, which is growing at a more rapid rate due to globalization. 
Now the median pay for kindergarten and elementary school teachers $53.90. Right? Average as fast as average. Okay. Post-secondary uh, language and literature teachers, their median wage is $58,620. Now, obviously, there are wide ranges. And the um, occupational employment statistics link makes a real um, point of saying that opportunities vary where, depending on the region of the country you're in. Depend, for teachers in K-12, depends whether your state, whether it's one of those states that has a foreign language requirement. Um, that, that affects the demand for foreign language teachers. But there are opportunities. That now, so we've got language services and we've got careers in education at all levels. There are opportunities out there. Okay. Careers in language services. We saw the data from the Occupational Outlook Handbook. And um, it was interesting. Um, I looked at um, a, an, a piece called the Top Language Services Providers from Common Sense Advisory. Now, Common Sense Advisory is um, it's a for-profit organization. And a lot of their reports are um, to purchase. And I will I freely say, the information that I have reported on is from their freely available material. And it's interesting, the fact that um, the sector is so big, $35 billion annually, and growing at, even in the post-recession era, was growing at 5 and 6% a year. Now, they, it's interesting to note that of the top 10 um, Let's see if I find that the, the exact data. But of the top 10 in terms of size, in terms of revenue, um, the top 10 of language services um, um, companies, there are about, let's see, five of them, I believe. Let me just read my notes. I don't want to give you the wrong information. Five of the top 10 LSPs, language service providers worldwide, are US-based. And these include Lionbridge Technologies, which was number one, um, TransPerfect Translations, number three, and Language Line Solutions, number five. And We Localize, number eight, and Manpower Group Solutions, Language Services, which was number 10. Of the top 100 language services providers, 30 are US based, and that's up from 25 in 2012. So from in one year, actually, there, in 2013, uh, 30 of the top 100 were US-based. In 2012, it had only been 25. Now, interesting for, um, I guess, um, prospective employees is the fact that some of these are privately held companies. So it's harder for students preparing for interviews or for the job search to find out detail about these companies. But some of them are publicly held. Um, in fact, let's see. Uh, Manpower Group is publicly held, and I believe Lionbridge is, but I don't have that in my notes. Now, another thing that American students might not routinely think about, and is that there are great career opportunities in the European Union. The EU is the single largest market for language services. And obviously, that's because of the multiplicity of official languages of the EU, geographic proximity, the European Union core values of, of multilingualism, and its practice of plurilingualism. It's a huge, huge market. And now you might say, but why is that important, particularly to American students? There are quite a few Americans who actually uh, who qualify for European nationality. Um, many people who might be heritage language speakers, children of immigrants, grandchildren of immigrants, might do apply uh, do qualify for European nationality, or if not, they might qualify for a European a blue card. So anyway, that is also an option if you've got a learner 
who's got languages and might qualify. There are all kinds of jobs, even jobs for lawyer linguists within the European Union. But obviously, because language is so important in law. Several of my students at Many Languages um, One World were studying translation and interpreting, planning for careers in the EU in language services. Um, now, career opportunities that are enhanced. All right, getting away now from the language specialist um, area. Um, how are career opportunities enhanced by foreign language skills? Well, one of them is this whole concept of cultural intelligence. Now, um, a lot of people talk about intercultural competence. Some people talk about cultural intelligence. Um, to my thinking, and I'm not claiming to be a specialist in this area, but to my thinking, they're very similar except intercultural competence is a skill that's operationalized in the social sciences, in education, in anthropology, in social work, in psychology, whereas cultural intelligence is a newer term, you know, building on other terms like um, emotional intelligence, um, and of course IQ, the intelligence quotient. And um, one of the um, uh, prominent um, authors on cultural intelligence right now is David Livermore, located in Michigan. And he actually talks about four factors in cultural intelligence. You know, it's not just enough to have empathy or interest. You actually, one of the factors um, that he mentions is knowledge. You've got to actually have knowledge about another culture. And there is, there's so much about another culture that is really t challenging, difficult to learn, more difficult, more challenging without the language than with it. Now it's interesting, just an aside, uh, I know Anne made a comment about the term CQ. CQ actually started to appear in the literature, I think back around 2004. And, um, there were a group of authors that were writing. And if memory serves, I think this current uh, author who's doing a lot with it may have been a postgraduate student at the beginning and now has really taken, um, is now the author of many of the current books on the topic. He's also, if any of you are interested, he's delivered a great course, one of these video or downloadable great courses on cultural intelligence. So there, that's, that's a key concept. Your cultural intelligence, one of the four factors is knowledge. And a lot of that knowledge is facilitated by language skills. Now, careers in international business. Um, you know, careers in international business, um, one of the um, factors um, that contributes to failure in expat assignments is that the expat, him or herself, and or family member, they're unhappy, they're lonely, they're uncomfortable in their placement. And, you know, if somebody, if you yourself or somebody close to you in your household, oh, that's, thank you, the cultural cue. That's one of the David Livermore websites. Thank you. Um, one of the... Um, factors that contributes to failure in expatriate assignments. And depending who you're reading, failure among American expatriate assignments, um, it can range, it can be 30%, 60%. These are people that are sent abroad, don't have the proper cultural and linguistic training, and they fail. They're unhappy. They don't succeed uh, in, inter in their international business foray. Um, there was an interesting example some years ago. Um, a company here in New Jersey, um, Lucent, was purchased by a French company. I think it was Alcatel. And part of the deal was that the American CEO would become the CEO of the uh, combined company. Well, within a year, that American CEO was um, no longer with the combined entity. 
and it was written in the business press, mentioned in passing that um, she was at the corporate headquarters in Paris, but she didn't speak any French. I have to think that that has to have played a role in, in her ability to succeed. And then other careers, as we said. Um, there's a local hospital uh, here in my area in North Jersey that I read recently in a newspaper report that subscribed to a translation service that um, translates 160 some odd languages. Um, and, you know, I had recently written, um, not written, I'd recently been reading a book, Natalie Kelly, uh, who had been at one point at Common Sense Advisory, I think she's now at Language Line, um, Lost in Translation. She has a chapter about medical translation and how important it is not just to have a person, a family member, a staff member who, who happens to speak the other language because um, medical translation, um, the slightest error, can really have um, deadly consequences. Oh, okay. All right. I see that Natalie Kelly. Yes. Okay. Now, here we go. David Livermore, um, and he's got his CQ Center in, in Michigan. Um, we, there was a very interesting article on culture, well, sort of on cultural intelligence. Uh, it was, What's Your Language Strategy? It was an article in a September 2014 issue of the Harvard Business Review that was devoted to taking your company, your, your service, your product across cultures. And one article was specifically on language strategy. And the authors had a very interesting um, take on it. And it wasn't just that people need to speak other languages. There are multinational corporations um, that have employees all over the world speaking a multitude of languages, but that they don't really strategize, number one, what language do they use for what purpose, how do they teach other employees or empower other employees to learn other needed languages. It's this whole corporate strategy piece that is missing. So I think the fact that Harvard Business Review just really last month uh, had an article on this, had a whole issue devoted to this issue, this type of issue, is really, is, it's, it's casting a very powerful light on the importance of languages in the global workplace. Now, some of you may have seen the 2011 rankings of languages in business. I always think it's interesting to show students you know, the Bloomberg organization um, put a lot of factors into uh, determining, and they were weighted factors, into determining what the most useful languages in international business would be. And, um, I mean, their conclusion, and you can look at it online, but English was the top, the number one language, Mandarin Chinese came in number two, and French was number three. And then they go on, there's a list of 10. Some of them languages you would think of automatically. Other languages might, might surprise you. But I know I always make a point to mention this to my students of French, who at times when discouragement might hit, might wonder why they're devoting their effort to this and just try to reassure them that indeed um, French may be more useful than they think of every day. Now, I have to admit, another uh, program that I came across some years ago in my research is the cyber program. And I'm sure there are some of you in, 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 in participating today, including Dr. Reisner, um, who know more about the workings of the cyber programs than I do. But I have to admit, there is the cyber that's closest to my geographic location is at Columbia University in the city of New York. Um, and I think the cyber program created back in the 80s and um, with, I guess, a current membership, the last figure I saw was 33, somewhere in the mid-30s. It varies depending who applies for the designation, who receives the support. But these centers 
really are inspirational. Um, they uh, combine languages with business training. They also serve as, as teaching entities for other programs that want to learn how to do this. You know, um, for one of my research projects, I happen to be looking at uh, graduate schools of business. And I just, it was a quick search of the US news rankings. And of the five top MBA programs, top business schools in the nation, and I think right now three of them are tied for number one. But what I was interested in finding out is that none of them really re had a foreign language requirement. Oh, I am sorry to hear. I see Mary's most recent comment. Um, they had, some of them had foreign languages as electives. Others had what they called global experiences. But when you followed the global experiences and you looked at the YouTubes and the PowerPoints and the presentations that were posted by students, you found that often when language was mentioned, it was mentioned that, oh, by the way, the teaching was done in English. Yeah, uh, I see Anne's comment coming in. You know, I, as I say, this was a very quick search. I really took the top five from the US News rankings, and I went, I looked on their business school website, and from what I could glean from the website, some mentioned electives, they all pretty much mentioned global experiences, but the global experiences didn't seem to include really talking to, to people and maybe to business owners in their own language. It seemed to be um, local faculty members who were fluent in English teaching the classes. And, you know, I, I, I think that really these programs could learn from the cybers. Okay, I, I see Mary's comment coming in. I think that's true. That's the impression I got from my mini search on that topic. <clears throat> now, other careers, government, medical, export. Um, many, many of the government departments, you have the, Dipl uh, the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service, you have agencies like the FBI, all kinds of law enforcement agencies. You have the military. You know, there are articles, there are government reports about the lack of foreign language skills. Medical, we spoke about a few minutes ago. And export, you know, it surprised me. I was reading, um, there was a 2010 report, Exports Support American Jobs. And it was talking about um, that it looks like 10.3 million jobs in the United States. And this was in 2008. Uh, the report was a 2010 report. Um, um, it were export related, export supported jobs. And it said this increase accounted for 40% of the total job growth in the United States during this period. And I mean, I'm thinking of companies large and small, companies everywhere, companies in business incubators, in entrepreneurial workshops, trying to get into the export business. Now, one of the things, um, the British have been very, very on top of this. Um, there's a, an organization called the CBI, the Confederation of, of Business and Industry. They do an annual uh, survey. And they are um, talking um, at length about how foreign languages are needed for the British workplace. Um, I think a little more explicitly than we are. OK, now I'm noticing business schools taking students abroad, but not much language is included. You know, I think that's true. Actually, study abroad generally, there's a whole subset of study abroad now that, and, and I'm guessing it was in an attempt to broaden the pool of potential students, where now you may be in uh, China or in, in Italy or in, in wherever, at Paris, but your coursework is in English. And that was not my experience studying abroad or was not my experience even studying at Middlebury. Um, 
but it, that seems to be um, a direction that study abroad has taken, that it's not all about language as it might have been at one time. Okay. Now, overcoming the discon disconnect. How do we overcome it? I think this partnership idea, that, like the many languages, one world, is critical. And I think developing the strategic framework to support motivation. You've got to get your parents, your grandparents involved. You've got to have requirements that are enforced in K-12 and at the college and university level. Um, you've got to have experiential learning. You've got to get your local communities involved. Um, I think Mary said it in the um, in the YouTube. You've got to bring your your the world into your classroom and your classroom out into the world. Um, you know, uh, there was um, an author, uh, Jonathan Swift, at the time University of Liverpool, wrote a very interesting dissertation that became a book on foreign languages in the business workplace. And one of his concepts that he wrote about is this concept of cultural affinity and being the strongest motivator. And, and I think that's so true. I, I once had a, a student in one of my Spanish classes who was my best student. She was an English-speaking North American. It was because she loved Spanish music. It doesn't have to be music. It could be any aspect of the culture. That's your most powerful motivator. Found to be really these intrinsic motivations more powerful than just the desire to get a better job. And we have to somehow awaken that interest in little ones and support it as they go through the tough adolescent years where students are pulled in so many different directions. Um, partnerships. We have to have the partnerships. Um, uh, we have to have advocacy. You know, this summer I had a chance to go to the AATF um, annual convention in New Orleans, and I got a chance to attend several workshops on advocacy. William Rivers, Jane Abrad, um, Bob Peckham were speakers that I heard. I think a strategic social marketing campaign is necessary. The European Union has done this. <clears throat> for its core value of multilingualism <clears throat> and its Erasmus program. I think you've got to take the best of Clayton Christensen with disruptive innovation. You've got to take um, Philip Kotler, social marketing, using marketing um, tools and techniques for the social good. You've got to take John Cotter. He's the expert on change management. You've got to take all of this expertise that we have and apply it to uh, the language cause. We have to learn from best practices. You know, Britain has really shown the way. They've had this partnership of The Guardian, the newspaper, the British Council, the British Academy. They just this past weekend had the big languages show, the language festival in London. They had the CBI uh, survey that I mentioned a few minutes ago. They've had countless reports, and they've got a big report due out, the report in, in the British uh, Academy's five-year program, due out in June or July of 2015 on going global. They have been really on top of this. I think partly because of proximity, also because of membership in the European Union. Um, and then also heritage language speakers. We have to empower these students to use the knowledge that they have. Um, a lot of times we don't exploit that. We're all about teaching them academic writing and academic speaking in English. But they've got this bilingualism um, already in place with just a little bit of training and direction. Now, um, I think I just I talked about AATF already. I kind of jumped ahead of myself. Um, I want to get here, though, to a couple of programs here at FDU. And they were re recently featured on um, um, the uh, Tiempo program, Latino News, on our local ABC affiliate here in New York. 
And we have a program called Puerta al Futuro, and then there's one called Latino Promise. And what they do is they've, they've got um, traditional age students and also more adult students who have the bilingual piece that private enterprise is crying out for. And really what they need is to just bring their English skills to the level where they can get these opportunities. And um, it, it's a great initiative. Um, you know, the, the, the programs are, the Latino Promise program is taught entirely in English. Puerta al Futuro transitions from Spanish language to English. They're both associate level programs. And then they transition into four-year and graduate programs. The segment that was on TV in August, all right, the link is here. It's a 10-minute segment. It's um, the director of the program and a graduate student and an undergrad. It's a truly inspirational, um, you know, something, again, a partnership that we could um, embark upon to empower our heritage language speakers. All right, two other programs, um, smaller programs here at FDU, um, in Mire Ro and Chengong, are similar programs to Puerta al Futuro, but um, they target um, local Korean language speakers and Chinese language speakers. Um, my particular region happens to have a very large and fast-growing Korean language population, and so this is, these are great empowerment programs for people. Okay. Conclusions. Um, you know, languages for all, uh, the conference that took place in um, September 2013, September 30th actually, um, down at, I guess it was the University of Maryland, the Center for Advanced Language Study. Um, they came out, they had reports from the conference, and then they came out with a final white paper report. And this one quote really, um, I think, says it all. 85% of us believe it's important for our young people to learn a second language, and yet 79% of Americans are still monolingual. That's even worse than the 75% that I quoted from the Gallup survey at the beginning of this talk. So it's time to shift the discussion from why should we learn as to why aren't we learning. And I'm really I'm so grateful for all of you who came out this afternoon. Um, to um, um, talk with me and interact with me and, and, and hear what I had to say. I think this is so important. And I see Brigitte type 79% is a much higher percentage than I would have guessed. Um, you know, I've seen figures as high as 90%. If you, if you, if you subtract recent immigrants and uh, other heritage language speakers, if you basically look at monolingual English-speaking Americans, uh, I saw a figure as high as 90% of Americans are still monolingual. Um, again, I'd like to thank you, and thank you so much, Dr. Reisner, for this opportunity. Thank you, all of you, for having been here and having hung in with me for actually an entire hour. Um, but I'm happy to answer. If you have any questions or comments, more than happy to answer. You know, and, and Mary, if you want to post the original PowerPoint, the longer version, more than welcome to. Um, I'm happy to share. And I'm also happy to give you my contact information. If you want to email me at kathysteinsmith at gmail, I'd be delighted to correspond with you and, and maybe work together on something. Um, Mary mentioned in her introduction the possibility of collaborations. Um, I think really um, make hands together make light work. And now I have a question again. How do you get all of this information to your students? Okay, interesting. Um, I, I uh, completed my doctorate late in life, 
You know, I was a working librarian. I had started out as a French and Spanish teacher. I served as New Jersey's first bilingual librarian for nine years back in the 80s. And then I've been here at FGU, um, largely um, teaching French and Spanish as an adjunct over the years. Um, but I did go back in 2005 to do my doctorate. And I did it um, on foreign languages of global competency and education for global citizenship, which is one of which is part of our university mission. But one of the tenets of my program at the union was social relevance. And to put this into very simple terms, you're um, quoted by one of my beloved advisors at the union. Your doctorate should be your driver's license. It's not your life's work. And finishing the doctorate, I felt compelled to try to get the word out because it is important. And I try to do that. I have a blog. I've written books. I try to write articles. Um, I did a TEDx talk. I'm so happy to be here today talking to my peers, my colleagues. Um, I, how do I get the word out to students? I teach. You know, I'm a full-time staff member at the university. I teach as adjunct faculty. Um, I, I teach um, usually one graduate, one graduate class a semester on international public administration. And then I teach one undergrad class. Um, that they're called Lang classes. They're classes about language and culture, but they're taught in English. And they tend to be large format classes with quite a few students. And I try to talk about these issues and certainly other issues to my students. Um, here on our campus, most recently I've heard we have 100 languages that are spoken. So we've got lots and lots of heritage language speakers um, who possibly are not aware of the opportunities that they are just one small step away from. And then we've also got lots of traditional students taking foreign language classes who may not know how extremely useful these skills might be to them in life as well as in the workplace. I hope that answered your question. Um, did I provide a link to my blog? Yes, I see the green arrow there. It's just a word. It's just a WordPress blog. Um, but I'm happy to have comments. And I'm happy to correspond with you. Uh, Kathy Steinsmith at Gmail is my personal email. Uh, please do feel free to contact me if you have any questions on anything I said today, or comments on anything I said today, or possibly things that I don't know about that um, I can bring to my work. If you want to bring to my attention things that I have don't know about yet. Yeah, I just asked Annie to type in the link to her blog because she's got. I, every time I look at it, I'm amazed. Yeah, there's some really good stuff on there. So if she can type that in, because I don't have it memorized. That would be great. I don't think I know Ann Abbott's blog. There you go. Spanish and Illinois at Blogspot. I'm going to have to have a look at that. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough as a young child, I grew up in a, a community that was largely Spanish speaking. At the time, it was the um, uh, migration of, of Cubans to the United States. So I grew up also speaking Spanish. And um, you know, I think Spanish is a wonderful, wonderful language to learn. I use Spanish every day here on my campus, talking to mainstream students, students from the Puerta program, from Latino Promise, um, in my neighborhood. Uh, but I also think, you know, other languages are also very worthwhile. You know, um, um, there's that whole thing of supply and demand. Spanish is a great language because it's so useful everywhere. But other, what they call the less, um, is it less frequently studied languages? Um, excuse me? Less frequently taught. Thank you. Thank you. The, the term escaped me. Those are also great opportunities for students. Um, I was reading yesterday the University of Washington got a $16 million grant um, to teach those the less commonly taught languages. 
and I think it was either UPenn or Penn State got a $2 million grant. They were just announced. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. LCT. LCTL. Thank you. That has escaped me. All right. Anybody else have any other questions before we close down for today? Have any comments or anything? Um, it was very useful, very interesting information, and um, I really appreciate you joining us today, Kathy. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, well, thank you, and we will put the recorded session on the YouTube channel, and the PowerPoint we'll put on the Noble site, and... Um, and I've been posting, actually, um, as the session's been going on, <laughs> some things. Thank you. So, Thank yeah, you. So, um, we really appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing everyone um, for the remaining webinars throughout the year. And, um, and continue the conversation, Kathy. I you know, would love for you to collaborate more with us with Noble, and especially now with the grad student group going in. I think... Mm -hmm. We could even have, you know, I mean, students in general can collaborate. You know, we just, we got to get the students' voice in and, and get their help. How can we promote this? And, this and as you said, they are, they are the Yeah. Thank you, thank you right. so much. I really enjoyed well, being with you. you today. Yeah, it was great. Well, thanks to everyone.